Welcome to Faith in the Folds, a podcast for ministry, biblical studies, and Christian living. I'm your host, Kevin Burr. Joining me on the podcast today is Michael Lacona, professor of New Testament studies at Houston Christian University and the author of several articles and books on Jesus. Most recently, Jesus Contradicted, while the Gospels tell the same story differently, published by Zondervan Academic and available at the end of May 2024. Mike specializes in Jesus' resurrection and has appeared in a number of public debates with specialists in the Bible and religion, particularly a famous seven-hour debate with Bart Ehrman, who has become somewhat of a, of a friend of yours, Mike. Is that right? He, he has, Kevin. And hey, by the way, uh, thanks for having me on. But yes, uh, Bart has become somewhat of a friend. Uh, you know, we get on stage, we debate, and we're passionate about our views. And um, you know, no holds barred, but, um, you know, after the debate, uh, we're fine. And, um, so yeah, <laughs> great. I like great. Bart. Well, Mike, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast again. You are one of my few three time guests on <laughs> faith in the folds. So, you know, special honor to you, my friend. <laughs> well, well, thanks. I feel honored Yeah, because I have a lot of respect for you, Kevin. I, I appreciate that, Mike. I was I was long acquainted with your work prior to uh, getting to know you. And for those who uh, who have been listening to the podcast for a while now, uh, Mike very kindly agreed to serve on my dissertation committee, and uh, then have I've gotten to know him as we've uh, connected at conferences since then. So, Mike, um, before we get into what we're going to talk about, particularly your new book, Jesus Contradicted, which I will link to in the description below, um, you have been studying the Bible and particularly Jesus and the resurrection for quite some time now. How did you get into all of that? Did you just know from an early age that you wanted to become a leading expert on the resurrection? <laughs> like what, what, what kind of led you to all of this? Yeah, no, I was, I'm, I'm a late bloomer. Um, in fact, some would say, well, he still hasn't bloomed, <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, you know, I, um, I actually, you know, I became a Christian at the age of 10, didn't grow too much spiritually during my teens, went to a Christian university, was a music major, and I did grow spiritually while in college and um, decided I wanted to get deeper into scripture. I wanted to learn the language in which the New Testament was written, Greek. So I ended up studying with the final doctoral student of F.F. F. Bruce. His name is uh, Ron Sauer. And um, man, he just gave me a passion to, to know the Greek New Testament. And so I was studying that. And then after a while, you know, I mean, I'm spending hours and hours every day studying Greek and you know, learning Greek myself and then, um, and then reading the New Testament in Greek. And then one day I'm just asking myself, you know, I'm praying at about an hour a day. I'm reading scripture several hours a day. And then I just kind of, for some reason, I asked myself, it, I believe this stuff is true, but can I know if it's true? What about people in other, uh, world religions around the world that were brought up as Muslims or Hindus or, or atheists, you know, well, do those who have religious beliefs, do, do they have similar kind of convictions or religious experiences that, that I believe that I've had? How do I know what I believe is true? And so this gave me uh, some real doubts. And one of my roommates suggested I see Gary Habermas. I was in graduate school at the time. Okay. And um, so I walked into his office and never had him for a course. Um, and um, he sat me down. He talked about the historical evidence for the resurrection. We talked for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, and I walked out of the office feeling pretty good. You know, I was just looking for a reassurance of my faith. Um, but then later on, I, I just started really questioning my faith again. And, um, you know, I just had these periods of doubt and there was no email. So I'd call Gary and um, many, many phone calls. And I just so thankful to him. I'm indebted to him because he spent all that time with me. I don't know that I'd be a, a, a Christian today had it not been for Gary Habermas because yeah. I, I just struggled with doubts. Um, and so, you know, I remember hearing William Lane Craig debate and um, I was thinking, man, this guy's amazing. I'll never be able to do that. But um you know, one, one time uh, someone contacted uh, Gary Habermas and asked him if he would debate Dan Barker. And Gary doesn't like to debate. So he said no, but he then he asked me if I'd be interested in it. And I said, I don't know, I'd like to debate, but 
you think I can win? He says, well, you probably know more about resurrection than Dan. I just started my PhD at that point. And uh, so I said, okay. And I thought I did pretty well in that debate. Even the atheist organization said that they thought I won that debate. So, oh, okay. um, so I, I enjoyed that. That was fun. And then I got another one that Gary declined. It was with Richard Carrier. And um, I saw how that encouraged Christians. Um, one guy emailed me who was there at UCLA at that debate. And he said, I, my friends and I were sitting on the front row. And I can't tell you how much you encouraged us in our faith because the professors and students here are very anti-Christian. And this guy later told me he was going into, he was a psychology major, and he later told me he was going into full-time Christian ministry. Wow. He had decided um, the debate had really impacted him that much. I was like, well, this is kind of fun. I'm enjoying this and uh, just progressing in my doctoral studies. Um, But as I was doing that, it was... um, I, I need to cut this shorter. So let me, uh, let's see. Uh, anyway, so the resurrection of Jesus, it, it just become became more and more solidified with me. And I tried to yeah. be as open. I tried to be as open-minded and as objective as possible. Nobody can be entirely objective. And I don't care if people believe me on it. I, I did this for me because I'm a second guesser by nature. I second guess everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so it really helped me. And so I'm studying the philosophy of history. I'm studying historical method. And I really, really got captivated by it. And I thought, you know, I could devote my entire career just studying the philosophy of history and historical method, not even related to Jesus or anything. But I thought, you know, I need to do this towards something that's going to make a whole lot more sense. And um, so, yeah, that got me more interested in historical Jesus stuff and then questions about the historical reliability of the Gospels. And I I wanted to come at the historical reliability of the Gospels from a fresh sense, not just the, some of the typical arguments, but what is it we actually mean when we say historically reliable, especially when applied to ancient historiography, yeah. which operated by different rules and conventions than mm-hmm. modern historians have. Um, I think these are interesting questions, and they 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 deal with a more fundamental uh, on a more fundamental level than most treatments of the historical reliability of the Gospels. So I really enjoy that. That's where I'm at. And of course, a lot of the question comes up, no matter what you're debating on when it comes to Jesus, about Gospel discrepancies. Mm-hmm. And so that led me into an eight-year study about Gospel differences. Published a book in 2017 by Oxford, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels? It's an academic monograph. And um Soon after that, people started saying, hey, can you put the cookies on the lower shelf? And um, so I didn't want to. I wanted That's a funny to way to put it. <laughs> with historically reliable. But um, um, yeah, so finally, I decided I would go ahead and, and do a more pop level. And so that's coming out uh, May of this month. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. Mike, if you don't mind, let me let me dig back a little bit into what you were saying earlier. You mentioned a, a couple of periods of doubt. What what led you to doubt? What was it? You know, was it you know, spiritual struggle? Was it uh, you know just in, intellectual intellectual difficulty? Like what led you to doubt? Um, I would say, according to what what Gary Habermas talks, he's written on doubt. I would think I thought it was intellectual doubt. Now, at first, it was intellectual doubt. When I went to Gary and I needed reassurance, that was intellectual doubt, I think. Yeah. And then a couple of times afterward, it was intellectual doubt. Um, but then I started to realize as I was going on, I'd, I'd say when I was in my doctoral work toward the end, this isn't necessarily, or actually it was after my doctoral work, so I think up through my doctoral work, it was probably intellectual doubt. And then I finished and it's like, you know, I was doing this to deal with my doubt. I wanted to get to the bottom line. I mean, if Christianity isn't true, I want to know it. Yeah. Um, I want to know it because I may only get one chance to get this right in life, you know, yeah. and it could impact my eternity. So um, this is the most important question one can ask about worldview. Does God exist? Who is he and, and what does he require? Um so, yeah, I, I I think that was intellectual doubt. But then, after my dissertation was done, and I knew I was as honest as I could be in my investigation, um, 
at least as honest as I was capable of being, as open-minded as I was capable of being. I have no doubts about that. Um, and I, I wanted to be able to walk away with that kind of assurance yeah. and never question myself on that. Um, but I started to have doubts shortly after finishing it. I thought, this is weird. Why am I still having doubts? And then, you know, the Gary Habermas stuff, back to that, he talks about emotional doubt. And the way I thought, no, no, I'm not even that emotional of a person. My wife calls me Spock at times, you know. <laughs> um, it's not emotional doubt. And um, But then, you know, Kevin, it's kind of like this. You know, I, I speak on stages, sometimes in front of large audiences. And when I'm on the bigger stages, the AV people, the video media people say, look, we got some tape on the stage. It glows. And you don't want to go outside of where that tape is because you go outside of where the lighting is. And so I might have 30, 40 feet from left to right on the stage. I might have 10, 15 feet from front to back. That's like, of course, it's easy to stay within uh, that area. Um, I could do cartwheels. I could walk, jog backward, blindfolded and not have a problem. Mm -hmm. But Kevin, if you took that same kind of thing, 10 to 15 feet wide, 30 feet 40 feet long and suspended it, but a uh, 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 you know, plank between two skyscrapers 500 feet above the ground and say, Mike, uh, walk across that. Uh uh. Mike, I'll give you $10,000 if you, uh uh, I'm not going to do it. I'll give you, I'll give you 100,000. Nope, I'm not going to do that. Well, mm -hmm. why? You know, you could do it. You could do it walking backward, jogging backward, cartwheels on it. No problem. I know. But what if, what if I were to stumble and fall? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Mike, you know you could do it. There's plenty of room. In here. I know, but if I did, it, it's like the, the consequences of failure there is just too terrible to think about. Yeah. And it's the same thing. You know, I look at worldviews. I look at the evidence for the resurrection. I've looked at the evidence for Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism. I've looked at, the, at atheism, uh, the atheistic worldview. And to me, the evidence seems pretty decisive that Christianity is true. Now, I know others are going to come at different conclusions, but to me, the evidence for Christianity, I'm betting my soul on this, Kevin. So um, it, it seems pretty conclusive. 100%? No. But it, it's conclusive enough for me. But still, I doubt. And it's that it's because, well, what if? What yeah. if I'm wrong? And that's what causes me doubt. That's emotional doubt, not intellectual doubt. Yeah. I think a lot of people, uh, at, at least in the circles that you and I have run in, you know, the doubts that some of us have felt in the past, the tip of the iceberg seems to be this intellectual doubt. But underneath that, once we can address those questions and it's still and the doubt still lingers, like you said, there's there's a sense of emotional doubt for for me when I have found myself in those times, a lot of it has been spiritual struggle. And eventually, you know, thankfully overcoming those spiritual struggles, I found that if there is doubt in some shape, form, or fashion, what I know I must do is still remain faithful. And then eventually I am able to work through that in some time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, hindsight being 2020. I'm able to see that, oh, okay, here, here's how God was working. I, in the moment, I needed time to get away from that and see you know, the bigger picture or something along those lines. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's been yeah. true for, for me. Um, Mike, real quick, before we get to your book, you mentioned a couple of things that uh, I want to ask if you could just briefly define those for, uh, you know, for folks who are kind enough to listen, who might not be specialists in, in the area of uh, you know history and historiography, you mentioned the philosophy of history. Um, tell us briefly what what is that, and why does that matter for how we actually go about doing history? You know, of Jesus as a historical figure or something like that. Well, the philosophy of history involves first of all, you have to define what is it. How do we define history? And you know, I found you know, one, two dozen different definitions that were given for history that mm -hmm. they, they don't agree with one another. You it's know, not just stuff it, that happened in the past. Yeah, you would think that's it. But, you know, yeah. you know, others will say, 
well, something happened in the past and history is our reconstruction of the past that, that uh, may be true or false to, to various degrees. Um, you know, Richard Rorty said um, that, that I, I think it was Richard Rorty, he said something like, history is what I can convince my colleagues happened. Oh, um, interesting. So you're going to have these different views of what history is. But yeah, I, I think, you know, we're trying to, to, to do a description of various events in the past. That's what a historian is trying to do, at least if they're practicing what I think of as history, like what you're thinking of history, mm -hmm. you're trying to, you know, the past happened. Um, and of course, there are going to be different interpretations of it. Mm -hmm. So you, you could bracket the interpretation. It's kind of like 9-11, you know, um, for those of us who live in the United States, is evil Muslim terrorists um, intentionally flew uh, planes into buildings, killing thousands of innocent people. Yeah. But Muslims in Pakistan, um, I remember when they were they had videos of them watching the planes fly into the buildings, the buildings falling, and they're jumping up screaming in glee like their favorite soccer team just scored a goal. Mm. Um, and it's like, oh, they would just say, holy men uh, gave up, sacrificed their lives in jihad for the cause of Allah yeah. to, uh, to uh, shock the infidels. Um, so, you know, Sure, there's going to be a grid and different interpretations of the events are involved, and, and that can be disputed. Mm -hmm. But history, you know, the events itself, what a historian is going to do is try, is piece together the surviving data and put together a description of what occurred. Um, and that description is going to be true to various degrees. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be exhaustive. Um, but yeah, that's what they're trying to do. And then a lot of times the historian is going to put their own interpretation of that data. Yeah. But that interpretation, of course, is going to be separate than their ability to reconstruct the event itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so that's the philosophy. So you have questions like, what is history? Um, how much of the past can we know? Mm -hmm. You have postmodernist historians who would say, we cannot know the past. Every reconstruction of the past is historical fiction. Um, right. Some even go as far as, you know, to say, yeah, it, it, all of it is. It's all fiction um, because the past is gone and there's all the grid in which the historian is interpreting data. You have the event itself. You have data that have survived. You have like with something like Jesus or Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great or Hannibal. You have historians in antiquity who write on it. Sometimes they're you many times they're using sources and those initial sources have their own interpretation right. that they put on it. And then the ancient historian is putting their interpretation of another person's interpretation of data. And then we modern historians are putting our interpretation on someone else's interpretation on the other interpretation of data surviving data from an event that is no longer recoverable. And so you can see how a postmodernist would play on this yeah. and say, see, the, the past is unknowable. But I mean, you can always use charged rhetoric like that. At the end of the day, I think we can know quite a bit about the past, mm -hmm. um, though not fully. So mm -hmm. the methods that are used, that's all part of uh, philosophy of history. The question of whether historians are within the right to investigate miracle claims yeah. <clears throat> is something that is debated, <clears throat> excuse me, even amongst general historians. Um, so yeah, these are all interesting questions, real interesting questions, even the criteria of arguments of inference to the best explanation, such as explanatory scope, explanatory power, less ad hoc, plausibility, things yeah. like that. I mean, you, we could just go on and on and talk about these things and what's justified in using here and what's the best way of putting it. It gets kind of interesting. Yeah, and that 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 chapter, so a lot of the things that you just mentioned, for those who are unaware, so. Yeah, Mike has a, a very hefty book on the resurrection of Jesus, and a lot of what you've just mentioned there, you you go into detail in. I think it's your maybe your first or second chapter there. First and yeah. second. First and second chapter there, and I I used much of the material that you were citing from in my brief chapter on the philosophy of history and historiography uh, in my book, and you're you're right. Um, 
that you know we can there is actually some things that we can know about history and to some degree maybe not convincingly for everybody but to some degree we can you know peel back layers of interpretation uh, and I think that's the thing that a lot of postmodern historians will get hung up on is that, well, it's just all interpretation piled up onto each other. So we're just playing the same language game as all of these other people. It's like, well, you know, it's it's not necessarily, you know, interpretation to say Jesus was crucified and died as a result. That appears to be pretty solid historical fact. The interpretation then comes on, you know, that was a, a, a sacrifice that was God's will, that was, you know, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, but a lot of what you mentioned just now was really beneficial for me in seeing, you know, kind of a bigger picture of where my area, some of these tools that historians use, how that fits into all this. And so that was, if, uh, if folks, if you're looking for a really solid, hefty, robust treatment of all this stuff, I'll I'll link to uh, Mike's uh, Resurrection of Jesus uh, in the description below. <clears throat> Mike, when we yeah, actually yeah, yeah. go ahead, just go ahead. to say something here. What's yeah. interesting is when I was doing my research, we looked at the um, course catalogs for all the Ivy League schools for the departments of religion and philosophy, and because um, <clears throat> a lot of people are, you know, in the religion departments of the Ivies are getting out and calling themselves historians of Jesus. So how much training have they had actually in matters pertaining to the philosophy of history? And so I looked at all the undergrad for philosophy and biblical studies or religion, religious studies, in all of these schools, undergrad, grad, and doctoral level. And I only found one seminar that was a doctoral seminar taught at Princeton at the time. That's it. That's it. Yeah. They just, other than that, they don't get any training whatsoever in the philosophy of history, historical method. And yet they come out and refer to themselves as historians of Jesus. Yeah. And, and so it, it's interesting that, of course, you're going to have disparity of opinions. A sure. lot of these folks don't even know what they're doing. And so they come to their conclusions with just a uh, a haphazard approach to this whole thing that's largely gu guided by their worldview and nothing else. Yeah, yeah. And, and they haven't taken into sufficient account how their worldview colors their assessment of what's going on. Scott McKnight makes, uh, makes a comment similar to that uh, in, in uh, one of his works where he talks about how— uh, The he, death of Jesus— I, 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 about the death of Jesus. Yeah, Scott's one of the rare New Testament scholars who studied the philosophy of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, he, and I, I remember citing him in, uh, I think, from from something else where he makes a similar comment. And uh, it says that, you know, basically, we, we think we're historians. Uh, we pretend to be historians because we're working with historical texts. You know, it says something to that effect. It's like, yeah, you know, that's actually true because uh, most of us don't have that kind of training to work with these sorts of texts. One of the I questions- I changed the that... oil in my car, therefore I'm an auto mechanic. <laughs> mechanic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would be an expert at home renovator since I replaced a few ceiling fans a couple of months ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mike, one of the things that uh, that gets mentioned when we're talking about historians and how historians do their work and what kinds of assessments historians can do when our primary sources appear to differ uh, relates directly to your new book that you've uh, that is coming out end of May 2024. There are differences in the Gospels. If you just sit and start with Matthew and read straight through John, there are differences, some relatively minor, some seemingly major in terms of chronology or how Jesus is presented by uh, by the certain evangelist. Mike, talk to us a little bit about uh, Jesus contradicted. What uh, what have you found and how how would that help someone who might be struggling with uh, with this issue of uh, of scripture presenting in some cases noticeably different presentations of Jesus? Well, Kevin, the, the matter of differences, discrepancies, contradictions in the Gospels, whatever you want to call them, um, it's not new. Uh, the early church fathers, 
recognized that there were differences in the way the Gospels reported the same events and mm -hmm. teachings of Jesus. And they struggled with it. And they arrived at their conclusions, different conclusions uh, about it. So you had Augustine um, in the late 4th century, early 5th century, who was making, uh, he, he really was partial toward harmonization. Um, I mean, he, he would go out of his way to harmonize, and sometimes they're quite strained. Um, <laughs> and he was like, you know, if one thing is wrong in Scripture, then, oh, it can't be, because this is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, then you had people like Origen, and there's some others who would say, well, um, uh, and especially at Origen, he'd, he'd say, well, yeah, there are definitely differences. Some gospel authors will place the same event in a different chronological context yeah. um, mm -hmm. than, than uh, some of the others will. There are different names that are used and things like that. And he said, you're, you're going to have this. And just like it is in other ancient literature, and he says, but um, there is this human element involved but there's the divine element. And so just as long as the message uh, is the same, it's not a problem. And so he would say these things are spiritual teachings. Um, so it's kind of like Johannine specialists. Most of them would say that, like even F.F. F. Bruce would say that John has taken the Jesus tradition and for he's taken it and recast them as an expanded paraphrase a translation of the freest kind yeah. and a transposition into another key and so much more. This is what F.F. F. Bruce, conservative biblical scholar, New Testament yeah. scholar said, um, uh, you know, our friend and, and um, your doctoral supervisor, Craig Keener, says that all Johannine specialists acknowledge some degree of Johannine uh, adaptation. So we know that John is, is changing some things. Mm -hmm. recasting it in his own words and a lot of times as as paul anderson uh one of the preeminent johannine specialists says that john is often a theological paraphrase mm -hmm. so it's it's a spiritual gospel you could uh, origin might say in that sense i think clement of alexandria called it a spiritual gospel so they wrestled with it they they came to their uh positions differently um and, and Christians have wrestled with these things over the years. I, I typically find that there are three approaches that evangelicals or conservative Christians have taken okay. toward differences in the Gospels. One is the ostrich approach, where they just say, I, I can't handle this right now. Um, um, the Bible's the word of God. There can't be any contradictions in it. And, uh, and these are just apparent discrepancies. They're not real. And I don't know why, but uh, that's what I believe. And they yeah. stick their head in the sand. That's yeah. the ostrich approach. Mm -hmm. I had that approach back in the early 1980s. I took that approach. Mm -hmm. um, then there is the harmonizer um, or the peacemaker. Uh, hey, we can harmonize it's all these things. Can't all four Gospels, can't we all just get along? <laughs> um, and I think that harmonization is a legitimate practice uh, in some cases. And then the third position is the cruel interrogator. This is where the harmonizer, like Augustine, I would put Augustine in this category, the harmonizer will take the gospel text and stretch them until they tell the harmonizer what he or she wants to hear, mm -hmm. um, the cruel interrogator. Well, I wasn't satisfied with any of those positions. Uh, you know, um, And so I looked for a new way. And Richard Burridge and others, especially Burridge, but others had come out at, back in the 90s and were saying the Gospels are ancient biographies. Yeah. And ancient biographers uh, reported things with a greater flexibility than modern biographers and historians do. And so it's like, oh, well, could this, I thought, could this account for differences in the Gospels? Um, and then so shortly after I debated Bart Ehrman the second time, I launched out into um, maybe the first time, I don't recall, um, I launched into a, a a deep dive into gospel differences to see how ancient historians would um, talk about, you know, uh, the same event, mm -hmm. like the assassination of Julius Caesar, as it's reported by Appian, Cicero, Dio, Livy, Nicholas, Plutarch, Suetonius, and Valius. They report the event with discrepancies. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so what do we do with these? Are we going to say all these reports are historically unreliable because there are discrepancies? Um, no, they all get the gist of what happened. They give us an essentially faithful representation of what occurred. And then I started to notice even when Plutarch, who's regarded as the greatest ancient biographer, reports the same event in two or more of his biographies of, mm -hmm. of ancient people, he doesn't copy and paste ever. In fact, some of the those, um, about six of them, he's writing simultaneously mm -hmm. and he's using the same sources. And yet there are differences, discrepancies. So what do we do with these? Well, you start to look at them and you see these are patterns, the same kind of patterns in which these differences occur. Whoa, these are, these are compositional devices that he's using that are resulting in these. And what if we apply this and read the Gospels in view of these same compositional devices that have been acknowledged by classicists studying these things in the classical literature for decades? What if we viewed the Gospels through the same lens? It's mm -hmm. like, whoa, uh, more than 90% of these differences come in, you know, whoa, it can easily be explained these way. That doesn't mean that all of them result from these compositional devices, but um, I'd say a large majority of them do. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I do, explored in this. So it is a groundbreaking, uh, my first book was groundbreaking, and it's a groundbreaking concept. Even Christopher Pelling, the leading Plutarch scholar in the world um, today, he, he was saying, that, you know, that he told me that it would be groundbreaking if you did it as much as you're doing it with Plutarch. And, um, and of course, the interdisciplinal um, disciplinary study of applying it to the Gospels hadn't been done before either. Um, so that made some groundbreaking, but then a lot of people said, you know, we, we want a, a, a more friendly version of it. And that's when um, I took a couple of years, probably two, two and a half years, on top of the eight years I'd already spent, and with greater reflection, wrote the new book, which just uh, this past weekend, I got a pre-published copy. I'm yeah, it looks good. I love the cover on it. And yeah. um, I think Zondervan, they were just wonderful to work with. Um, and I guess I'll just to add one more thing in there. Um, over the years that I've been lecturing on this, a number of believers would say, how does this all square with the doctrines of the divine inspiration and inerrancy of scripture? Yeah. And so I wrestled with these things over the last uh, few years, several years since the other book came out. Um, and so I have two chapters on that in the end. Yeah, let's uh, let's talk about those, Mike, because uh, as we were discussing this before we actually got into uh, the interview, um, my my church tradition has a very high view of scripture. But I, I don't know if you were to ask the average church member, hey, explain to me your view of Scripture. I don't know if they could do more than say, well, it's it's God's word. And, you know, it's it's useful and profitable for you know, teaching and correction and, and all that. But beyond that, I don't know what more the average person uh, you know, would be able to say, because we tend not to. Uh, we, we talk more about inspiration. And my circles, we tend to talk less about inerrancy, which is something else that we'll get to here in just a little bit. But Mike, talk to us a little bit about that. Is like, what, what, how, how, how can we say that these things are inspired? You know, whatever we mean by that, when you know the evangelists are writing things in ways that are noticeably different. You know, what does what does that even mean for inspiration? That's a good question. It's it's not one that can be easily answered. Um, William Lane Craig in his forthcoming volume one of his magnum opus on uh, philosophical theology, a systematic philosophical theology, he says that the doctrine of scripture is one of the most underdeveloped doctrines in all of contemporary philosophical theology. Mm -hmm. So I typically find that uh, conservative Christians, evangelicals, will take a top-down approach to uh, the doctrines of inspiration and inerrancy. Okay, well, the Bible, God cannot err. The Bible is the Word of God. Therefore, the Bible cannot err. Um, well, how do we know that the Bible is the Word of God? Well, because the Word of God, uh, because the Bible says so, 
like in 2 Timothy 3.16, there's typically two major verses that are used to support that. 2 Timothy 3.16, mm -hmm. all scripture is theonustas, God breathed. And um, then 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, but men moved or carried along, born along by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. These are the two. So I think, you know, they, they take these verses and then they get this concept of what inspiration looks like um, based on those two verses, mm -hmm. concept of what inspiration looks like. And then that's how they build their doctrine of inspiration and assume the Bible must look like this because this is our concept of inspiration. And that concept of inspiration would yield the Bible that we have today. Mm -hmm. So what I what I did in the book is I said, okay, well, what do these verses actually say? So in order to do that, you look at theonustas, mm -hmm. and you know what TLG is. It's this uh, this service, this uh, software. It's only available online that you have to subscribe to, and it has digitized and tagged all the ancient Greek literature beginning in the 8th century BC, all the way up through, I don't know, medieval times. Yeah. Um, and so you got to stop somewhere. So I, I looked at <laughs> the Anustas because yeah. it appears many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So, so but, you know, words change over the years. The meanings mm -hmm. change over the years. So let's just look at, let's say, the beginning, which the oldest occurrences are the 1st century, uh, maybe the 2nd century BC, all the way up, let's just take it up to origin in the early third century okay. before you get to origin. Yeah. There are only eight clear occurrences of the term during that time, and possibly as many as 13. I say that because it's hard to date some of them. Sure. Um, like the Sibylline Oracles. There are two of them in the Sibylline Oracles. Well, they could date as early as the second century BC, but they could be in the what the particular text we look at could be fourth or fifth century yeah. AD. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's just hard to say, but we know at least eight and maybe as many as 13. And in none of those, is it clear that it would take it as origin takes it. Um, and origin, even he, he would take it as more of a modern sense, but in his view that allowed a spiritual gospel that some of the the way he interpreted theodnustas could result in a Bible that actually had errors in the surface details. Mm. Um, so it, it's hard to say. I agree with the Lexham exegetical. Um, I think it's the Lexham exegetical commentary which says, you know, it it just means theodnustas could it all we can be certain of is it means that it has its ultimate origin in God, but we can't say more than that. Yeah. And then when you look at uh, Second Peter text, it's saying no prophecy of Scripture, no prophecy of Scripture. Now, some would say that's referring to all of Scripture. Some would say it's only referring to prophecy. Um, I, the, the the Greek term that uh, Peter uses there is pharaoh, and um, that's a term that's very similar to what Josephus and uh, Philo uses. The, uh, theophoritas, and there's another one too, I, it doesn't come to mind. And those are referring to more like dictation. And so it seems to me that in this context, since the term prophecy is also, also used here, it's referring to prophecy that was dictated somehow to a prophet that got put into scripture. Yeah, so like, referring thus to saith actual, the Lord. That's right. Yeah. It's not actually referring to all of scripture. Mm -hmm. Um, or else you get more of a dictation view, which nobody accepts, because if you take scripture as being dictated by God to the human authors or human writers, well, then what do you do with 1 Corinthians 1 16, where Paul says, mm, I don't remember if I baptized anyone outside the household of Stephanus. <laughs> if it's dictation, then the Holy Spirit said, wait a minute, Paul, you're getting ahead of me. Uh, let me go check heaven's records. And then he finds the relevant item missing. Yeah. What do you or in do First when, Corinthians seven, right, where Paul says, "You know, I, not the Lord, command this." There you go. Yeah, yeah. Then it's not not the Holy Spirit allowed him to put in his own parenthetical <laughs> comment there, right? <laughs> Press pause on the Holy um, Spirit for just a second. Yeah. <laughs> so if it's not, so I don't think the Second Peter text really refers to 
um, the mode of the inspiration of all of scripture. So uh, Mike, let me, tip- let me hop in just for a second there and point yeah. of clarification for the audience. This, this Greek term that we're discussing, theonoustos, it is typically translated as something like God breathed. And so yeah. that, that, that's how, that's how a lot of Bibles do it. And so the idea, right, is, you know, God really granting in a sense, you know, the words of scripture to, to the author, which I, I guess it maybe if pressed is not terribly different from what we're now describing, you know, from the, from the other passage, the, this idea of divine dictation. And so, right. yeah, yeah, so those the, might be conceptually similar ideas there. Yeah, we get it. But, you know, the we, 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 we that's what we do get. We get that impression. God breathed. It sounds like dictation. But, you know, there are words um, that we use in English that have a little it, we wouldn't take it by its literal meaning. It, it's come to be an English idiom, I'm sure. So um, and the same would have happened in ancient languages. Right. Um, so we we have to rather than taking a top down approach. Oh, by the way. The term is used of sibyls, streams that uh, provided water for sibyls. They are, are which were pagan prophetesses. That's in a sibylline oracle. So, and dreams are uh, divinely inspired. So, if streams and dreams can be divinely inspired, ointments that are put on Abraham's corpse are dev- are God breathed. I mean, what does it? Uh, oh, the ch- teachings of the church, according to the um, the lives of. Um, hmm. Papillus, Carpus, and there was one other one, um, says that the teachings of the church are theodistas. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hmm. Well, the teachings of the church sometimes contradicted one another in those early days. Yeah. Um, so what are what teachings of the church are they referring to? Um, there's certainly a human element there. It's uh, it's really hard. So I think rather than doing a top-down approach, we got to do a bottom-up approach. Okay. This is a concept that Mark Strauss uh suggested to me and it's like okay you want to take what scripture says about itself but since that can be interpreted in a number of ways let's look at the phenomena of scripture itself mm-hmm. what scripture does if we're believing that scripture is divinely inspired let's look at what scripture is the final product mm-hmm. and then try to figure out and guess on the process that that would produce the product that we have yeah and then see if that is compatible with what Scripture says about itself. So that's what I wrestle with in this in this this uh, chapter on inspiration, fine tuning yeah. the doctrine of inspiration. We're basically taking Scripture at you know as it's presented to us, and allowing Scripture to show us the ways in which it is inspired. And so it does include things like divine dictation. Absolutely. Like I said, like I mentioned earlier, you know, thus saith the Lord kind of material. But for me, one of the easiest ways to uh, to teach this in a church setting or in a classroom setting uh, for, for, you know, for a general audience is to look at, for example, Luke chapter one, verses one through four, where you know, like Luke actually explains part of his process. And, you know, because Luke is not claiming, thus saith the Lord, for everything that happens in Luke and Acts, he's instead showing us, you know, I've researched these things carefully and, you know, talked to, you know, eyewitnesses and people who were there at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. Like, well, okay, then inspiration appears to include that kind of perspiration element (laughs) as well. You know, it's like, is that fair? That's that's definitely fair, Kevin. That, yeah. That's really good. Yeah, I agree. So, okay, so with inspiration, then, and having a maybe a more robust and uh, you know scripture backed understanding of inspiration, talk to us a little bit then about uh, this notion of inerrancy. First off, Mike, if you don't mind, define that for us uh, if, if you can, because th- like I said, that's not something that a lot of folks that are in the church circles that I run in really talk much about and um and help us kind of see you know like what what you have what you've argued in in this new book and and you know why why maybe we need to be aware of that yeah you know inerrancy kevin i'm finding this you know i've been to other countries um southeast asia south africa um over in the scandinavian countries 
Um, it's mainly those in North America, oh, and South Korea as well. North America, South Korea, I found that use the term inerrancy. It's important to them. Whereas a lot of these other countries, you know, they have a high view of scripture. They'll like infallibility better, um, mm -hmm. authoritative, uh, things like that. Um, but for, for some reason in North America, a lot of us have uh, embraced this, this view of inerrant. Um, so there are various definitions of inerrancy. Um, the Lausanne Covenant came out with one in the, in the 70s. And then in 1978, you had um, a meeting in Chicago and then uh, of a bunch of people, but three scholars were tasked to iron out a statement on inerrancy. That was Norman Geisler, R.C. Sproul, and J.I. Packer. Okay. And then you had signers. You know, they, these three crafted this statement, put it forward to others, and uh, they signed it. A little over 300 people signed it. Some, most were scholars, some were not, but uh, they were evangelical leaders if they weren't scholars. And it's called the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. And in it, they take eight pages it's a painstaking uh, definition, eight pages to describe what inerrancy is and what it is not. Mm -hmm. And despite all the effort for that, there was still disagreement on what inerrancy involved, even amongst the three people who composed it. So, for example, Norman Geisler, in his commentary on the Chicago Statement, said that theistic evolution was incompatible with the doctrine of, in, of inerrancy as defined by the Chicago Statement. Whereas J.I. Packer said there was, uh, you know, he, he, I asked him before he died. Uh, we, we met a couple of times. We, co we spoke on the phone. We met in person uh, a few times. And, um, and he told me that he didn't have any position on, on theistic evolution, whether it was true or not. Um, but he said he didn't have any problems with it when it came to be a, you know a person believing in the inerrancy of scripture as defined by the chicago statement um and embracing theistic evolution mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of hard to dispute that with packer since he's the one that wrote the definition <laughs> that's his author yeah. authorial intent right mm -hmm. we can know it because we've heard from the author himself but another one of the authors their author authorial intent said no it's it's incompatible so I mean, there's all these different definitions of inerrancy. Um, you know, I like to just say, I, I like to go with what the evidence can bear. I don't want to go beyond what the evidence can, can bear. Some people might even not like my my definition and say it, it goes beyond what the evidence can bear. Uh, but I'd say the Bible's without error in all that it teaches, uh, or it's inerrant in its meaning, what it's intended to uh, convey in its meaning. Um, and some people aren't going to like that one. Some people are going to say, I, I, I don't go far enough. Some are going to say, I, I go too far on that. Mm -hmm. So I just got to go with my own you know, conviction on this. I don't think that the arguments, like with the Chicago statement, it says it's inerrant in the originals. But even people like Geisler, as strict as he was with inerrancy, according to the Chicago statement, he acknowledges that our present Bible has errors in it. Um, well, a lot of good that does, you know, right. we don't have an inerrant Bible today. So if a person came up to him and said, well, Dr. Geisler, do you believe that the Bible I'm holding in my hands that I read every day, um, is this the inerrant word of God? He would have had to have said no. Um, so he's got a firm grasp on an yeah. empty sack. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I say the Bible is inerrant in what it teaches, I would say that it's inerrant are, are the, the autographs and our present Bible. Does that mean there were errors in the autographs? No, but I just don't think that the arguments for an inerrant autograph are that compelling. Yeah. It's it difficult because we just don't have any of those. You know, well, we have it for a very long time. Yeah, we don't have those. And it, it would be interesting to see what kind of criteria we could put together to, you know, determine whether something is an autograph or not. I, I I would be interested to know that kind of, you know, what what could be said about that as well. But so, Mike, if it, you know, like, help me help me kind of, you know, bring this down to a level of, you know, somebody here in the pew, uh, say that 
they're reading through their Bible and they get particularly to the Gospels and they notice that, you know, Jesus never goes up to Jerusalem in the first three uh, until uh, until his last week. Uh, but in the Gospel of John, he appears to make several trips up to Jerusalem and they begin struggling with, you know, what what that what that means and and wondering, you know, are these guys even talking like are these evangelists even talking to each other? They all appear to be either associates of Jesus' disciples or disciples themselves. What uh, what assurances could we give somebody that you know, like, no, this it what you're seeing is not anything to be afraid of? Yeah. What assurances could we give somebody there? Well, I go, I go by two principles. Okay. So let, let me say th uh, two things. Number one, there are two principles I, that guide me. Number one, our view of scripture should be consistent. Our view of scripture should be consistent with what we observe in scripture. I think most mm -hmm. people would agree with that. But yet, I mean, it's a common sense thing, but it needs to be stated. Our view of scripture should be consistent with what we observe in scripture. Second, if we want to have a high view of scripture, then we need to embrace it as God has given it to us, rather than attempting to force it into a mold of how we think he should have. And if we refuse to do that, we may claim and believe we have a high view of scripture, but in reality, we have a high view of our view of scripture. Mm, yeah. So we start off with this top-down thing, and, and it's like, you know, this is the view of Scripture we've come up with. But look, Scripture hasn't changed. Our view of Scripture may have changed. We should not feel threatened by what we see because it doesn't attack Scripture itself. It's not like when we see some of these things, like the surface discrepancies, that it embarrasses God and causes Him to blush because we found Him out. I mean, come on. He knew these things were going to happen right. before they even penned them. It's due to our incorrect concept of inspiration that have led to an in incorrect concept of inerrancy. And it's our concept of inerrancy, it's our concept of inspiration that need to be adjusted. That's what's being threatened here, our concept of inspiration and inerrancy, not scripture itself. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Um, <laughs> The second thing I would say, and I'm, it slipped my mind, I'm trying to bring it back here. <laughs> um, well, what's so um, helpful? It, what's so helpful about that in particular, Mike, is again the importance of letting Scripture speak on its own authority, and then us acknowledging that it has this God-given authority in the way that it's given, like you said, in the way that it's given. And so, what that has mean is, you know. God, in his wisdom and in his grace, has always been willing to partner with humans, you know, uh, uh, unstained by sin in the garden, and then after the fact, stained and under the curse of sin from Genesis 3 onward. God's always been willing to partner with us in our limited capacities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as the Psalms are, uh, you know, of a variety of types, they still present, uh, you know, ultimately a message of, of faithfulness of God's goodness, of His grace, of His of His chesed, right? That Hebrew word that means something like covenant loyalty. They they consistently present those messages. God is one who can uh, take our our laments and our weaknesses, but also you know is worthy of our praise and adoration. That within that you know variety of, of human experience and expression. God is able to breathe out his word and share his word with the world. I don't see how it would be any different with the evangelists then that, you know, allowing for individual expression, that the message of, you know, Jesus coming to establish the kingdom here on earth, that, um, you know, the Holy Spirit is alive and well within the church, that um, Jesus uh, was uh, crucified, uh, died as a result. Uh, resurrected and ascended to God's right hand, that all of those are still present despite the variations in uh, in expression by the evangelist. That that to me has been so comforting and, and just even you know at times wows me because of how gracious God is that even in our fallenness, right, He's still willing to partner with us 
to be able to um you know to to you know send his word out into the world and to do his work of establishing the kingdom before for Jesus's return yeah yeah I, i'm i'm with you on that kevin um it it did come back to my mind what i was wanting to say too so um no matter what view of scripture we, we take, if we believe in the divine inspiration of scripture, and in the book, I give reasons to, to think that the scripture is divinely inspired. And I present a, a model by which this, this could happen. Um, but if whether you believe in inerrancy or not, whether you take a Chicago statement view of inerrancy, or even a stricter one, uh, if there is one, um, or more of a, rel a relaxed view, of inerrancy such as I take, um, whatever view one embraces in that way, there's going to be faith involved, okay? You can make rational arguments, but you're going to still have a degree of faith involved. And so what mm -hmm. I'd say is this, you know, if a person says, well, how do you, if you take your view that scripture is inerrant, all that it teaches, how do you, how do you really know that? Because if God allowed some uh, discrepancies or contradictions or errors uh, in in the minor details. How do you, how do you know that he any of it is inerrant? Well, I could say that with a very strict view of inerrancy as well, and say, well, he allowed some errors to creep in over the years through the, the process of copying. Even your most conservative inerrantist acknowledged that, like Norman Geisler. So if we have if he allowed errors to creep into our present text, then how do we, how how do we know we can trust any of it? Um, you know, so it, it's going to require faith, no matter which view you believe. So here's where I take some comfort. So it doesn't go over the cliff. You could say, look, if God loved us so much that it resulted in the incarnation, then it just makes sense that He would, in His sovereignty ensure that what is necessary for us for salvation and for living the Christian life uh, successfully, that that would be preserved in Scripture. We would have sufficient accuracy for all that is needed um, through God's sovereignty. He would see that it was preserved. So um, I just don't really see a, a problem either way. Um, and you say, well, but that's taking a leap that God in his sovereignty. Well, if the resurrection of Jesus occurred, which I think is, to a large extent, historically verifiable, well, then the rest follows. Yeah, it certainly fits with God's character, like what we can know of God, that, you know, if if, if all these other things, you know, whether you know, we talk about them creeping in or you know, things like that, that what is necessary is still clear yeah that you know, we would have what we need um yeah mike i, I like that that's that, that's helpful and and that's that's reassuring and I, I could see how uh whether you know you know a student or someone in um someone in church who might be wrestling with these kinds of issues you know i i can see how that would that would maybe you know, ease some of their doubts that um, that God and his graciousness, if he has done all this right, he would not have gotten us so far, you know, with the incarnation and the resurrection, only to leave us, you know, in a lurch and not know what more we can do with that. Yeah. Mike, any parting words as we uh, wrap up this morning? You know, I guess um, I could say, you know, uh, when I when I teach course Scripture and Apologetics Implications at HCU, it's a graduate level course, um, and we get into this matter of gospel differences, inspiration, things like that. Um, it's interesting to see the the different uh, reactions of the students. Um, initially, some of the students are troubled by seeing. Mm -hmm that the evangelists, the gospel authors, took liberties with, you know, bending some of the details on occasions. Mm -hmm. um, it, it bothers them because it, it's not in concert with their concept of divine inspiration. Yeah. Um, but then what, once they, they start, I say, you don't have, in my CLAP courses, you don't have to take any position. You don't have to take my position. But 
I want you to think through this. And if you take a position different than mine, I'm fine with that. But I want you to think through it critically um, and arrive at an informed decision. And usually by the end, they're saying, wow, it now I will never read the Gospels the same. And when I do read them now, it's like reading them again for the first time. And for some of them, it's like a, a light bulb goes off. It's like, whoa, this is pretty cool. And others, they fret a little bit over it. But I say, look, it, it's like jumping into the swimming pool or going to the beach in the summer. Um, well, depending on where, you know, but um, it, you, you get into the water and it's initially a little shocking, a little bit uncomfortable. But once you're in the water for maybe two minutes, your body adjusts to it. And it's like, oh, this is refreshing. And it's the same way when we have a paradigm that we hold that is challenged, um, we, we can be uncomfortable at first, but let the ideas marinate, think through them and say to yourself, you know, if, if you don't like this paradigm, what paradigm do you embrace? Does it explain what we observe in scripture better? Um, think through these things. And uh, most people over time, they think, you know, what you're saying there makes a whole lot more sense than what I've been embracing. So if some of the things that Kevin and I have discussed uh, during the, this this, this uh, interview, if, if you're troubled by it, you know, just give it some time, think through it some, and, um, you know, grab the book. It's, I'm not saying, I mean, yeah, I'd like you to buy the, the book. I don't make much money off of it. <laughs> Kevin can tell you, you know, unless you're selling a bestseller like a Lee Strobel book or something, yeah. you're, you're not making a whole lot of money off of yeah. it. Yeah. But I think it will really help you and it will challenge your, your paradigm probably. Um, but, you know, we should want, if we truly love scripture, let's get an accurate view of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mike, really appreciate your time today, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. It's always a pleasure, brother. Bye-bye.